Thank you so much for joining us for church this morning, Act in Faith Bible Church. Uh, let's start off with some singing. To God be the glory. happening soon so October is almost here and when we get to October what's going to happen we're going to start meeting for church on Sunday morning we will be outdoors but we're going to be doing it because we think the weather is going to be getting better so maybe bring a half and um, we'll be meeting out here on the patio and I'm really, really looking forward to that also we're going to have a business meeting after church one Sunday in October it's going to be really short not like our usual ones just kind of brief and we'll have handouts for everybody we're going to have a baptism service in October, so if you have not been baptized and you'd like to do that, come talk to me about that. Give me a call. And let's see, there might be some other interesting things happening in October, but we'll let you know when they come along. But we're trying to get back to as normal as we can be now that the fall is full into movement here. And we're really happy to be back on Sunday mornings because we know it's a burden for some people who get up really early to go to work on Monday. So. Um, hopefully we'll all be together. I just want to encourage you to come come to church, uh, still be involved. They had a great ladies Bible study uh, on Saturday, uh, this Saturday, and uh, it went really well. And uh, just started the book of Ephesians, and a lot of folks came out for that. So gals, be a part. It's really exciting. Learn the Word of God, uh, fellowship, with a little bit of distance. Uh, feel free to wear masks, 
and uh, we're going to make it through this thing, and we're going to be uh, stronger at the end, okay? All right, we're in Matthew 27. We're going to look at the last three hours of Jesus' time on the cross today, which is the more significant part. The first part was really interesting, but now he's bearing the weight of the world. So we're going to look at that. Get ready. Good morning. Here we are back in Matthew 27. We are back uh, looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, this is extremely significant what we're going to be talking about today. So um, I want you to pay attention and uh, really be ready to worship in your heart as we think through what Christ went through on the cross. So as we approach this crucifixion once again, we're really coming now to the heart of it the purpose for it, the reason um, that our hearts should adore it and love it and love what Christ accomplished there. I should tell you up front, we're approaching, I think what every theologian down through the ages has called a, a deep mystery. Uh, it's something that we can't fully understand. I mean, what we are told isn't difficult to understand. It's actually simple, but to think it through and to try to go deeper than just the simple truth of it, that Christ is dying in our place, that is really difficult to, to grasp, and we shouldn't even try. It's like the Trinity. It, the, the God is a being infinitely beyond us, and we can't grasp everything about him. But we can grasp what we need, uh, because that's made very simple, and it's a simple, glorious truth. And from there, we just can't get much deeper, because to get deeper would be to be able to plumb the depths of God himself, and we just can't do that. We'll never be able to do that. Even in heaven, we're still going to be finite creatures, and we won't know what an infinite God is like. But as we approach this text today with humility in our hearts, I hope, and, and awe, uh, we're going to find here the foundation of our salvation. This is, the, this is laying the foundation of our salvation. You can't be saved without what's happening on the cross here. So the death of Jesus is not something that just happened. It's actually the centerpiece of God's plan for the ages. If, if history has a center, this is the center. And that's because we're talking about redemptive history, which is all about the eternal destiny of every human being, you and me. If you think about history, the history of nations, human systems, religions, philosophies, none of that's going to last. In fact, the universe itself is slowly winding down. It's releasing energy that never gets reproduced, and it, if you just let it go on, it won't be forever, because eventually the whole universe is going to be kind of a medium cool. Everything's sort of winding down. People are going to last, because we have souls that are made eternal. So that's what matters, and What's happening on the cross here, redemptive history, the key to redemptive history, what it's all been looking forward to and what we, after it, look back to, that's the center of history because that has to do with our eternal souls and where they're going to be. So that's everything. So you always want to start when you're thinking about great truths, you want to start with the, the great questions, the, what I call the big questions, and you want to get a big picture of what reality is. That's so important. I don't know how many people really sit there and think about what's the big picture, but that's everything. You have to understand what it's all about, what life is about, what history is about. The big questions give us the, the context of our very lives, our experience on this earth. It tells us where we fit in. So what are the big questions? Well, things like what is man? What, is, what are human beings? What really matters? What is our place on this planet especially with regarding these amazing capacities we have that put us far above all the other creatures on the world. Why are we like that? What does it mean? What's it all about? Well, the human story is a story of what Pascal, the philosopher, called greatness and wretchedness. We are amazing and we are a mess. That's the truth of the world. 
We have great gifts and utter folly characterizes the human experience. Here's the foundational truths according to the Bible. There's two things you just have absolutely have to know. There is a creator God who is infinite, wise, he's a person, and he's holy. He is pure goodness. The second thing you have to know is that we rebelled against him. And that's the human condition. That is the situation you were born into. A race of rebels. And we're, that's our natural state to be in rebellion against God. That's why you are not as good as you'd like to be. See, I don't have to read your heart. I just know that that's true because that's what the Bible teaches. And it's true, isn't it? You're not as good as you'd like to be. That's true of everyone. That's true of me as well. You are part of a fallen race. The Bible tells you that. It explains that for you. Your wickedness is not the product of having evolved from beasts. Because our gifts are so much greater than animals, our sin is so much greater than anything they do that we find abhorrent or horrible because they're not acting out of malice and wickedness. They're just doing their thing. But we are evil. When we lie about someone, when we slander, when we're envious, when we want to hurt, when we're jealous, when we're covetous, that's evil. And animals aren't like that. So that part of us doesn't come from them. It's, it's ours. Your wickedness is far greater than an animal's can ever be because your gifts are so much greater because you're made in the image of God. So I know what morality is. I know what love is. I know what wisdom is. And I am seriously deficient in those things. I am not what I would like to be. Certainly not what I should be. Because God made us in his image and we decided to become our own gods. That's our problem. We walked away and set our own course and said we will rule. He won't rule us. We will rule ourselves. And that's the problem with the world. So we trashed our gifts and our great privilege. And my sins are far more significant because I'm made in the image of God. It's, it's a defiance of what he designed for me. I can reason I can reason morally. I have moral capacity. I think morally. I, I hate it when people wrong me. And yet I am morally guilty of sin as well. Too often I've chosen wrong. And I'm that way because our race fell. So a curse was laid upon the world because of human sin. That's why decline is woven into nature. The whole universe is declining. And we die. We have to die because the wages of sin is death. But the cross of Jesus, that's our subject today. The cross of Jesus is the way God provided so that wicked human beings like me can live. That's what it's all about. By having somebody worthy pay our debt to divine justice. So folks, the Bible is God's word to us. It has the key to understanding everything. The key to understanding ourselves and the condition of the world around us. That's why it is so lame. The whole world is so lame at achieving good and being satisfied because it always seems to go wrong, doesn't it? Corruption in, impacts every part of human life. That's why governments fail and people are act irrationally and there's so much hostility in the world because man has fallen. We walked away. We broke the thing that matters most, which is a right relationship with God, our creator. We broke that. We are made by him and for him and man was made a moral creature in a universe governed by a moral creator and we chose something else. We just decided to go our own way. So our choice has led to death and despair and frustration and failure. And what does that bring us from our pure and holy creator? It brings condemnation. It has to because he's good and he has to condemn evil. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. 
But that's not all. God loves. He has this profound love for us, these fallen, wicked creatures, his wayward creatures. And he's de devised a way for us to come home to him, a way that makes our future glorious and satisfies his holiness at the same time, his justice. And he did that by undertaking the penalty that we deserve upon himself in Jesus Christ, the God-man on the cross. That's what the gospel is all about. He bore it himself. So last week we looked at the first three hours of Jesus on the cross and we saw him pray for those that were killing him, who were horribly abusing him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We heard him promise paradise to a robber being nailed to a cross next to him. Today you shall be with me in paradise. Today, he told him. We also saw that he made sure that his mother was well taken care of since he wasn't going to be around by his spiritual family. So that just got us sort of to the halfway point of the six hour crucifixion experience. And we noted that a change happened at noon. That Matthew describes it like this in Matthew 27 verse 45. It says now from the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. So from noon to three. That's the sixth hour and the ninth hour in ancient reckoning. So it was a regular day weather-wise until noon. And Luke uses this language. He says the sun became obscured. And we don't know exactly what that looked like. But it got very, very dark. And it's a very dramatic change. Long before at, that, at the time of Passover the first Passover, God brought darkness on Egypt and it was a sign of God moving in judgment against Egypt. And in a similar way, there's a veil of darkness being drawn over the dying Jesus, the dying Messiah. It's, it's a veil of death. It's a veil of separation between the Father and the Son. And so we have this famous cry from Jesus in verse 46 says about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying Eli Eli lama sabachthani that is and he translates it for us my God my God why have you forsaken me now I said last week that I believe it was at this moment that Jesus begins to fully experience not just the tortures devised by men but the outpouring of the wrath of God on sin. And that's why the amazing cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The whole thing about death is that death is a separation. When we talk about physical death, our spirit is separated from our body. They go apart. That's why a body com becomes completely lifeless. When a, when a soul departs from a body, you can just tell. It's just a whole different thing there. And there's been a great separation. Spiritual death is a separation between our souls and God. So that's much more serious. Both are serious, but that's much more serious. So here, Jesus is taking our sins on himself so we can be reconciled to God. That's the plan. So, Because we're under this sentence of condemnation and our death would be final separation from God forever if Nothing was done about it. And here's Christ reconciling us to God by taking our sins upon himself. Remember, to be judged by God for sin at the great day of judgment is to be cast away from him. That's the separation idea. Separated, permanently separated. So the mystery here on the cross is how can we understand God the Son who's been eternally one with the Father how can we understand him feeling separated from the Father? Well, we can't. We can't really understand that. We can understand that he's dying in our place, that he's bearing sin, because that's uh, something you can just grasp. Okay, that's what's going on. He's the sacrifice. That makes sense. We can believe rightly that Jesus put himself there. We can affirm with the words of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 that the Lord was pleased to crush him putting him to grief if he would render himself a guilt offering and that's what he did and God was pleased to crush him to bring him to grief. 
So the Father and the Son agreed to save sinners by enduring, having the Son endure the full penalty of sin. So we can believe this incomprehensible love for the undeserving because of what he did and what the scripture tells us about it. But beyond that, I don't think we can really understand the full experience here. Or we just have to adore him for going through it for us, truly being separated from the Father in some amazing way that he felt. J.C. Ryle, the great uh, preacher from the 1800s, he said this, he said about Jesus' cry here, there is a deep mystery in these words which no mortal man can fathom. No doubt they were not wrung from our Lord by mere bodily pain. They were meant to express the real pressure on his soul of the enormous burden of the world's sins. They were meant to show how truly and literally he was our substitute, was made sin and a curse for us, and endured God's righteous anger against the world's sin in his own person. At that dreadful moment, the iniquity of us all was laid upon him to the uttermost. Heavy must have been that burden. Real and literal must have been our Lord's substitution for us when he, the eternal Son of God, could speak of himself as for a time forsaken. I think he captures about as far as we can go with it. It's an amazing thing. So it does express the reality, his cry. It expresses the reality, the indescribable weight of his experience. But one thing it doesn't do that some people come to when they hear those words, it does not express doubt on Jesus' part or any kind of hostility toward the Father. Jesus' words are, are an experience, not an accusation against God, like, why have you left me? That's not what he's doing there. So let's talk about these words themselves. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like I said, some have read these words and concluded that at the end, Jesus lost faith somehow, that uh, the pain of crucifixion was too much for him, that he had appointed himself the Messiah, and he really wasn't, and He's just crying out now because he feels abandoned by God. He thought it was all going to work out for himself. So a really famous historian, and I've got the big collection of his works, The History of Western Civilization, Will Durant, who was very big. He was not a Christian, and he didn't think particularly kindly of Christianity. But he did believe that this event had to have actually happened in history, that Jesus had to have uttered these words from the cross, because in his mind, why would they put this in the, in the gospel since it makes Jesus seem like he's despairing? And if we're supposed to worship him, why, why would they add something so real? He says it's too real to be fake. That's how he felt about it. But is it a cry of despair? Is that what the cry is about? I, I think it can be seen accurately as the cry of the lost because he is experiencing what, what the lost will experience since Jesus is truly standing in the place of a sinner. In some very profound way, he did experience abandonment. He felt it. But it's clear that Jesus is not faithless or doubting in this situation. And I can say that very confidently for several reasons. First of all, the words... He's, he's speaking to God, my God, my God. So he's talking to God. It's, it's a relational thing to say. Those aren't words of doubt. They're words of affirmation. God is still his God. And then after this suffering, when we come to the end of the three hours, the, the last three hours of Jesus, he immediately is on intimate terms with the Father again. He calls upon the Father. He submits himself to the Father. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. So there's a relationship that's going ongoing after this suffering. And there's something else we cannot forget. And we talked about it a little bit last time. Although, although Jesus means the words that he says, the whole question that he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the first words of Psalm 22. And last week we looked at Psalm 22. We've spent some time there already. And let's go ahead and turn there now. That'd be a good place to be. And, oh, I turned right to it. 
I must have been there recently. So my Bible just fell right there. So we, we said that Psalm 22 is a perfect picture of the crucifixion of Jesus specifically written by King David 1,000 years before it ever happened. And we pointed out that all of it is from the Messiah's point of view. It's actually like you're on the cross seeing this and that's what he's writing. We, so we not only have the visual experience of Christ from the cross, what he's seeing, we have his mind as well because all of this is expressed in words. So I think Psalm 22 is describing the experience he's going through, his thinking. So while the cry on the cross is real, the context, the context in Psalm 22 tells us where his mind is. And it's not in a place of doubt. So let's start. It's, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. So there's that sense of being abandoned. But then verse 2. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. So that continues that thought, that feeling of being abandoned. Uh, where is God? So that's that feeling. He's not seeing deliverance because he's crying the cry of the forsaken sinner. Now, Jesus had never felt anything in his whole life except being close to the Father. I mean, in his time on earth as a man, he was in perfect fellowship with God, a constant awareness of God, a complete trust in God's presence, a complete experience of God's love for him. He knew that. But on the cross, as he's bearing the wrath of God on sin, that feeling is shattered. It's just not there anymore. Because he's standing in the place of a sinner. So he's experiencing the judgment, the wrath of God. The darkness comes. The wrath of God is poured out upon him. So he's feeling the experience of those who are shut out of heaven. Jesus himself described this as outer darkness. That's his description of what hell is. Outer darkness. That again is the idea of complete separation. Abandonment. Paul also used the language of distance and separation for those that are unwilling to have Christ as their savior. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine, he describes eternal destruction this way. He says, eternal destruction is away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Away from, distant, abandoned. You wanna know why Christians want people to come to Jesus? I mean, why do they? Why do they wanna share Jesus with you? So that you will avoid that separation that's going to come on judgment day. That you will be reconciled to God, not separated from God. That's why they want you to come to Jesus. It has nothing to do with them winning an argument or you've got to be in their religion instead of yours or anything like that. It's that God provided a savior. He reconciles us to God. He brings forgiveness for our sins. And you need to know him. You need to have him in your life. That's why. In Galatians, Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He did that for us. So it's all about him. So Jesus is feeling all of it. But does he doubt? Does he doubt God's goodness or God's holiness or God's justice? Is he despairing on the cross? Does he believe that God failed him in some way? No. No. Even though the, those first verses are expressing this sense, this feeling of being abandoned, look at verse 3. Yet, okay, I feel this, yet you are holy. So this is a prayer. What's Jesus saying? I feel abandoned, but I know you are holy. That's what he believes. Oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were delivered. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. Okay, what's he doing? He's rehearsing what he knows to be true about God, even though he feels abandoned. God hasn't changed. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. What does that tell us? 
Well, there's a really good practical thing for us right there. Trust in spite of how you feel. You can feel all kinds of things, but trust is a decision that you make with your will. And he's choosing, you can see it in the words of the psalm, he's feeling the abandonment, but he's choosing to trust in the God who's always been faithful to, to his people. So, in you they trusted and were not disappointed. Let's read on, verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. That's what they're saying. And then he says what in verse 9? Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Well, we talked about verse 6 through 8 last week. It's a perfect description of what's happening to Jesus on the cross as the elders and the priests and the mob and the people passing by on the road are yelling at him and cursing him and telling him to come down. Even the words are almost exactly the same. But verse 9 and 10, they are fascinating. These verses point to something that I didn't experience when I was born and that you didn't experience when you were born. There is a perfect relationship of trust with God that the speaker here has that is completely unique in Scripture. Scripture always views children as born in sin, as needing to learn about God, as needing to be born again. Uh, to be with God, to be taught carefully. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And Proverbs tells us that. And all of that goes right back to what I said earlier about man's sinful nature, our fallen condition. We're born into this rebellious, fallen state. We're not born in a relationship with God. We're born as rebels. And that's why we rebel against our parents. That's why we rebel against authority. That's why we rebel against God. We go our own way. We are souls in great need of reconciliation with God right from the beginning. David says, it, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was a sinner from birth. We share Adam's fallenness, his corrupt nature. But this person, this person is different. Very different. He has a one of a kind, perfect trust with God from birth. And this speaks of Christ's attitude on the cross. These, these words are meant, and the, Jesus using the first verse of Psalm 22 is to bring us here to see what he's thinking and what he's going through. In extreme distress, even feeling forsaken, he turns to what he knows, not how he feels. Now let's make sure we understand why this cry from the cross is so significant. It is a heartbreaking moment, but at the same time, it is a most sacred moment. Not all sacred moments are beautiful and quiet. This is a loud, bloody, bu um, brutal, beautiful moment. He asks, why? Why have you forsaken me? Why? So you have to understand the answer to that. He is being forsaken for us. He's being abandoned for us. He is bearing our sin. The sin you committed yesterday, the one you might commit tomorrow, Jesus, the God-man, the infinite, eternal being joined to a true human nature carries the weight of the debt of your sin the sin of a whole world of rebels in himself. He, he's standing in our place. He stands as the sacrifice for all of human sin. He, John the Baptist said of Jesus, he, the, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if we continue reading Psalm 22, it, it leads us into the next saying of Christ on the cross. And now we're coming to the end of the, the three hours. 
So we're further along now. It's getting very close to 3 p.m. Psalm 22, verse 11. Be not far from me. So he's appealing to God again. He's, he's not doubting. He's trusting. For trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. And then we read that last week. Now this part, verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. So just look at verse 14 and 15 there, how completely dried up he feels. One thing we know about crucifixion, not only from medical science, but also from historical descriptions of crucifixions by eyewitness, is that men who are crucified have a raging thirst, an incredible thirst. One medieval account speaks of a man who actually lived for three days being crucified. And he was in the sight of of a stream of water beyond where he was. He could see it. And he was very stoic and very courageous when they crucified him in in the face of death. But he begged and pleaded for water. One cup, one drop, give me a drop of that water. He was just begging from the cross for water. Well, John chapter 19, verse 28, he says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. So one has a really strong sense of completion in those words. Uh, There comes a point when he has endured the fullness of his forsaken time and paid our debt for sin. We can't really know again what that was like, but we get a sense from these texts in human terms that it's kind of come to an end at this point. He doesn't, he doesn't seek relief during this time of the outpouring of God's wrath, the, the outer darkness of the soul. He's not seeking relief during that time. But now, having accomplished what he came to do, he seeks for something to drink. And all that remains for him is to yield to death, to surrender his spirit. And maybe it was that the drink would allow him to speak loudly because he has two more things he has to say that are really important. So maybe he needed that to be able to speak at all uh, loudly. But his final words, John continues in John chapter 19, verse 29. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now Luke tells us that in giving up his spirit, he uttered also these words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's how we know he didn't doubt. That's one of the ways we know. Because he loved the Father and he was giving himself back to the Father commending himself to the Father. His work is done. He's not forsaken anymore. But he still has to die our death. So he's giving himself over to that. Complete confidence in and love for the Father. But the words you have to make sure you never forget are it is finished. Those are some of the most important words in the whole Bible. Let them sink in deep salvation for any Christian, anyone who is truly in Christ, who has received Christ as their Lord and Savior, salvation is finished. It's accomplished. Those words, it is finished, sweep away all striving to be accepted by God. All ritual, all dependence on human religious authority, all works-based righteousness, earning my way to heaven, salvation is accomplished on the cross. You cannot add to it. You can only accept the one who achieved it. That's what you have to do. You cannot add to what he did. It is finished. Faith in Christ as Lord and Savior is what brings 
to you the benefits of what he did on the cross and nothing else can do that. There's all kinds of, you know, spin-off semi-Christian religions running around out there, cults and religions and groups and all founded by supposed prophets and seers or Bible students or this or that. And they all have one thing in common. In some way, all of these groups say it's half finished. It's not complete. You have to earn the rest. They all say that. That is deadly because that is a great lie. You cannot get to heaven by your merits or achieving something. Christ paid for your sins. You're already forgiven in him. You can't earn forgiveness from God. One of the best descriptions, uh, I mean, one of the best questions you can ask somebody to determine where they are spiritually. They, people used to do, use this all the time, but I think it's still kind of valuable. It's the question, if you were to die tonight and found yourself before a holy God, what would you answer him if he said, why should I let you into my heaven? So if God asked you that question on judgment day, what What would you say? That's kind of a question to see where people are. If you say, I am a good person, or if you say, I went to church regularly, if you say, I taught Sunday school, if you say, I knocked on doors and handed out religious material, if you say, I gave to the poor, if you say, I marched for justice, anything like that, those might be good things to do, but he won't let you in for doing those things. That's not how you get into heaven. Some good things do not atone for a life of sin. They just don't make up for it. And when you stand before God, you will have an instant awareness of his absolute goodness and holiness, the purity of God, this burning holiness. His presence will will be like a light that's so bright it illuminates every dark corner of your soul. There's nothing left unexposed. And you will know at that moment that you will have nothing to say for yourself. You won't be able to utter words like, I'm a good person or I did this or I did that because you will know how deep your sin runs. Better to know it now. Better to be honest about it now. On that day, pointing to your goodness or your religiosity will will seem like a bad joke even to you. I don't think you'll be able to even say it. You'll be overwhelmed by your unworthiness. Well, if that's true, then I'm doomed. I mean, death only holds terrors for me. No, it, it doesn't have to be that way because you can die in perfect peace. Why can you die in perfect peace? Because of three words. It is finished. Christ accomplished salvation and if you put your faith and trust in him and follow him, turn from your sins and embrace him, you're forgiven and you can die in peace and you won't be abandoned because he was abandoned for you. Christ bore your sins. He paid the penalty. Paul says something kind of amazing to the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. He says, when you were dead in your transgressions, he made you alive together with him. He's writing this to Christians. Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So he's using kind of human imagery here like, uh, you know, there's a warrant out for you. It's from God and there's a million sins on there. And uh, what are you going to do about all that? Well, Jesus took all of that and, and nailed it to the cross. He paid the penalty to justice for you. So it's all taken away. Debt paid. Debt paid. And any degree of punishment that is deserved By you, if you're in Christ, is marked paid in full. The debt is paid. So Jesus purchased our salvation. All good works are just the fruit of that salvation. The root is what Jesus did. That's the foundation. The fruit of that is a a new life. But not a perfect life because you're not going to be perfect. What about all that sin I'm, I'm still doing? It's finished. 
It was paid for. He died on the cross for that too. But that's why you must come to him humbly as an unworthy person because you are unworthy as am I. Sin separates people from God. Jesus reconciles people to God through his blood. When you come to God unworthy, accepting that perfect and complete sacrifice, then you are accepted by the Lord. Not just as a servant of God, but as a child of God. It's actually better that we fell and were redeemed because we're actually going to have a higher status with God than we would have had we never fallen. God always makes things better. That's why the cross is the center of history because that a glorious salvation was purchased for us by him. What happened there saves souls eternally. So seek the Savior and do it until you have him. Make sure you have him. Well, there's more. Um, at the death of Jesus, remarkable, even miraculous, amazing things happened. Things that bear witness to the significance of of what he accomplished on the cross. And we'll look at that next week. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful. We are in awe of what Jesus endured for us. He bore the penalty. He experienced outer darkness. He experienced abandonment, which our sin deserves. And he carried all of it on himself. All we can do is say thank you Humble us. Let us hide under his provision. Let us come to him with humility and grace and to serve him and love him out of thankfulness for what's a done deal, a salvation fully accomplished. We ask you to glorify yourself in our lives and may we share this wonderful news with others. We pray in his name. Amen. Okay, we'll be back next week in the same chapter.